At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to the president of Double Line, Ron Riddell. Please go ahead. Well, thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Double Line webcast with Jeffrey Gunlock and Andrew Sue. The title of today's webcast, Dust in the Crevices. If you'd like to see the rest of the webcast schedule for 2023, please go to DoubleLine.com. I want to highlight some thought uh, leadership in the media. We have two uh, podcasts, the Sherman Show podcast and Monday Morning Minutes. And we also have a YouTube channel, uh, Ken Shinoda on uh, Double Line's Channel 11. And then we have the new PS Perspectives. Our product specialist team uh, does a series of videos highlighting uh, financial markets, macro events, and drivers returns in various segments of the market. So you can, you can uh, there's various mediums to view all of these or listen to these, but please just go to DoubleLine.com to find out the details. So with that, without further delay, I'm going to turn the webcast over to Mr. Jeffrey Gunlock. Thank you, Ron. And thanks, everybody, for joining us here as we barrel along through the middle of 2023. Uh, this webcast is entitled uh, Dust in the Crevices. But as always, there's sort of layers of meaning to these titles. And uh, basically, what, where, where this came from was, for starters, I was looking at a sculpture, like a 110-year-old sculpture, and I asked the auction house for a condition report. And the condition report came and it said almost nothing. It said, there is dust in the crevices of the sculpture, which I guess you'd expect for a 110-year-old sculpture. But uh, it struck me that there's sort of dust in the crevices of our financial institutions here in the United States, and perhaps the, the general global world order. Uh, and it came into focus when I was coming up with a title for this webcast because the debt ceiling debate was going on. And going way back to basically when that sculpture was created, we've had the debt ceiling uh, in, uh, from basically about 1913 or so. And it's been raised now, I guess, 99 times if uh, the last one counts as a raise. I guess we just kind of eliminated it for a couple of years so we could spend as much as we want. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that this debt ceiling thing is pretty dusty, and our method of getting along has gotten very, very dusty. I, on the title page of this presentation deck, I've had the Grand Canyon, which is, uh, that's a pretty big crevice, but obviously uh, it also serves as a metaphor for the huge divide of our political system. But here's the chart of the U.S. budget uh, deficit as a percentage of GDP. Uh, on a rolling, uh, basically a one-year basis. And we see that we've been in a trend, and I've talked about this many times, we've been in a trend towards worse and worse budget deficits as a percentage of GDP. And we see that the, the extreme case, of course, was the COVID situation. We rebounded up to a budget balance as a percent of GDP that looks like the depths of past recessions uh, prior to the global financial crisis. And now we have uh, abandoned fiscal rectitude once again, and here we are an economy that is supposedly growing, and yet we have 7.3% budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. We can see that it's climbing very quickly. And I would guess that with the bill that was just passed, that we're not gonna see much uh, movement in the positive direction of trying to balance our budget. And so we'll probably be headed towards a much bigger uh, deficit as a percentage of GDP, particularly, if we go into recession, the red shaded bars on this chart are recessionary periods as uh, declared by the economic group at, at the, in the federal government. And we're already at levels that should be pretty scary relative to uh, past recessions, and we're not even in a recession yet. As we'll see as we go through the economic slides in a moment, that uh, as I've talked about in the past six or eight months, it sure looks like the percentage of probabilities of recession have been going up. And so we're really going to be looking at some pretty substantial debt problems. And I think the way that the budget debt ceiling discussions, if we can call them that, went down shows that even the politicians have to start admitting that these, these issues have to be getting addressed and not 10 years from now. It has to be addressed in the next few years. Let's put it into broader, longer-term perspective. This is the U.S. budget deficit going back to 1855. And you can see there actually were periods, extended periods, where there was no budget deficit. And then bad things would happen. And those bad things in the first huge deficits were war, civil war, and World War I. And then came World War II. So three really bad uh, deficit periods thanks to enormous wars. 
And now we're sort of in a war, a proxy war perhaps, uh, in Ukraine uh, versus Russia. But we now have, uh, again, a, a very extended period now of virtually no balanced budget going back really almost in my lifetime. And I'll be 64 years old this year. So we need to address these problems. But here's the problem, that the fiscal responses to recessions have really gotten out of control. We see that uh, the 01.com bust, we had a, a gigantic growth in so-called additional deficit. That's basically increased deficit spending as a response to attempt to stimulate the economy. We see 2007 was about the same in the global financial crisis and the pandemic you know, broke all records. And so the response that we've been getting from the federal government to economic problems has been zero interest rates. That worked uh, for a while. And then came the huge budget deficits uh, financed by uh, quantitative easing. I'm not going to talk a lot about quantitative easing today, but uh, here's uh, the real kicker of this section of the presentation. And that is that how much interest is being paid on the treasury debt. The, the bottom, the green line, is a percentage of GDP, and the top blue line is just dollars. And so it was fine to run deficits, I guess, when you had zero interest rates, at least from a sort of pay-as-you-go point of view, and your interest rates are non-existent, you can borrow as much as you want, you don't have the big interest expense. But now we have the, both the budget deficit increasing, like I showed on page one, and of course, everybody knows the Fed's been raising interest rates for a while now. Uh, they've raised interest rates about 525 basis points on the Fed funds rate, and many uh, Treasury interest rates are up 400 uh, plus basis points from their trough back in uh, 2020. So this blue line is really headed higher, and now that we're seeing that happen, uh, we're getting very rancor, a lot of rancor in the, in, in the debt ceiling talks and the budget talks because nobody knows what to do that with interest expense going up this much is going to swallow all of the uh, tax receipts in the next few years if we stay on this track. And so everyone knows that we have this uh, required spending, entitlement spending, uh, defense spending, and when they try to uh, balance the budget, there's not much of the budget left. It's something like 15% uh, of the budget is what you're down to in terms of being able to address these problems. So we're either going to have to raise taxes or we're going to have to uh, restructure the entitlement programs, which is the third rail of politics that nobody wants to talk about. But I do notice if you look really carefully into the crevices of our political system, people are starting to realize that there's dust in there and they're starting to realize that uh, we have to start talking about this. And I do think that that's going to become a political issue as part of the 2024 presidential campaign. Not only is the government spending money, of course, but for a while, uh, the government spending money went into people's pockets. And so pe personal finances were uh, in pretty good shape. I mean, thanks to the government uh, money spray, but people were not using revolving credit very much. They were flush with money from the government. But now that we've had more inflation for food and energy in particular over the past uh, two and a half years or so, we are now seeing credit card usage go way up. So we now have credit card usage. It says net monthly change on here. I'm not sure that's really the number. I think this might be year over year change because I did see a statistic last week that the year over year use of, of credit cards is up about 17, 18%. And that's what this shows. You can see this, this is one of the largest growth uh, spurts that's been sustained at this sort of a percentage level uh, on this display, which goes back uh, 23 years. So we have a lot of problems with debt and its management. Let's talk about the probability of recession now, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. The leading economic indicators, the LEI, looks absolutely full on recessionary. And not only is the 12 month number negative uh, 8.04, but the six month number annualized is 8.70. So it's even more negative than the year over year number. What that means is the, the momentum of leading indicators has not improved. In fact, it's, it's dropping at the same momentum or even, even a little greater momentum over the past six months than it did over the prior six months. And those red, red shaded areas, of course, are recessions again. And it's pretty clear that we have the look of uh, soon to be at the front end of a recession. The, here, this chart is uh, one of my favorite indicators. It's consumer expectations of the future, like one year forward minus the current situation. And you'll notice that the red shaded areas of, of the line graph, um, those represent periods where you're starting to, you're seeing the expectations of the future 
getting really, really bad, where the consumer expectations of the current, their assessment of the current situation is still holding up reasonably well. You'll notice that when the red shaded area below the zero line starts to contract, that's when you have to really worry about recession. That started to happen a couple of quarters ago, but it's not happening now. So this suggests that a recession is not imminent, but certainly the conditions for recession are ripe. In other words, if people believe that their current situation is starting to deteriorate, that red shaded area will shrink and will probably introduce us into a vertical red like uh, shaded red bar situation. So, just keep, okay. Here's the yield curve, twos, tens. And what we've done here, and I've used this exhibit in my last uh, webcast, what we do is we take that blue shaded area, uh, that is the 25th to 75th percentile of the data going into recessions. So we have the, uh, black vertical uh, line that's at the zero level, that's historically, we know, by because it's history, we know that that was the first uh, announcement of the recessionary period. So the uh, lines at, to the left of the zero that are the, the those, those, that shaded area, that's how this, the twos tens yield curve proceeded sort of on average is the black line and median is the yellow line, what, it, what does it look like going into recessions is the point here. And the red line is where we are now and somewhat arbitrarily placed. But it shows that using this indicator and uh, our uh, macro team thought that this was probably the, the best way to place it even though it's somewhat arbitrary. I would suggest you might wanna place this uh, a little bit further uh, to the right, but it looks about right to me where they have it. And so what we, you really need for the recession is you'll notice that the yellow line, the median and the black line, the average, they start to de-invert uh, prior to the recession. You'll notice that the black line de-inverts about uh, eight weeks before the recession. The yellow line looks like it's about 12 or 13 weeks before recession. And maybe we started to de-invert on that red line, but uh, not by much. So we had some de-inversion going on. We'll see that in a few slides. But right now, we would expect the short rates to start falling would be the real indicator that a recession uh, might be at hand. That short rates are, are the two-year treasury yield is off of its highs, uh, but it has been uh, rising uh, more recently and the yield curve has been de-inverting. So this puts us close to recession. And all the next few charts are the same type of analysis for different indicators. So there'll be a blue shaded area, and there'll be the red and the yellow lines, and those will be the median and the and the average, or the uh, average and the median, respectively. So here's uh, leading indicators leading up to recession, and here we have that same sort of a look. In fact, where we have to place the uh, the, the uh, current situation. In this case, it's it's a black line, not the red line of the previous slide. I apologize for that, but it looks like based on leading indicators, as we saw from that chart a few slides ago, it sure looks full on recessionary. It's kind of like right now on recession watch using the leading economic indicators. Here's ISM new orders. Uh, that like leading indicators looks all very recessionary already. It sure, certainly looks like the manufacturing economy is in recession in the United States on virtually every indicator you look at. Here's another one, this is ISM PMI. And that, again, looks like we're already in a recession. And the red line here is the average. And we're tracking very, very close to the average of the 25th to 75th percentiles historically leading into recession. Here's, here is a loan officer uh, lending survey data. And we've got it. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, the uh, red line. And that is plotted. Uh, with GDP, so la lagged by one year. So basically what we should show here is a high correlation between loan standard surveys tightening, which is that red line going higher, and leading into a recession with a high correlation and great regularity. And so what this suggests is that, that blue line, which is GDP, is about to go up. And this is uh, charted inversely. So it's inverted. So as you move higher, in other words, when the blue line goes above zero, that's really going below zero in terms of GDP. 
And so the red line of loan survey is suggestive that the economy will be in recession using this correlation uh, within a year from now. And it looks like this blue line is certainly going to be headed higher on the correlation. This is the unemployment rate, which we like looking at, and we plot it versus the 12-month moving average. And one thing that we notice is in the last two recessions, right before those recessions came, the black line went above its 12-month moving average, which is the red line. Uh, that has happened now, but not in a terribly convincing way. It's higher by four basis points uh, than the moving average. And sometimes this data gets re revised, so I don't think we can call this a crossover uh, in a really definitive way. But if it, it, it does put us on watch. The next employment report will be quite important. If unemployment rate rises in any meaningful way, it would probably be a recession signal. Now, this is there's false signals on this. So a chart that we like to use is we use the 36-month moving average, the unemployment rate versus its three-year moving average. We haven't plotted that out, but your eye can tell you we're clearly not close to crossing above the 36-month uh, moving average because we're still so close to the low over that 36-month time period. But this is something to watch for, and right now it's, uh, it's close to flashing a recessionary signal for real. Here's uh, something interesting. This is ISM supplier delay, uh, su supplier delivery delays. And we all know that one of the causes of the inflation of the past couple of years was the tremendous supply chain problems. But you can see that uh, using this ISM data, they're completely relieved. The supply delivery delays are the lowest that they've been in something like 14 years and really at one of the lowest levels in 30 years. And I saw a chart today that we didn't include that has the same sort of a, a, a thing for the global economy. And it appears that the, the delivery delays in the global economy are now, at, are now at the lowest level ever. So this is obviously suggestive. Why, why don't you have delays? Well, it's because you don't have the demand, or at least uh, supply is now greater than demand. And so that's indicative of a weak economy as well. Next slide, this is interesting. This is financial situation deteriorating. This is sort of a survey asking people, and this is the whole population, I think, the adult population in the United States, are you better off or are you worse off than where you were 12 months ago? And the uh, squares, uh, that, that is you're better off. So you'll notice that in 2017, 18, and 19, it was at a reasonably high level. People felt that they were better off, about a third of the people, than they were 12 months prior, and the people that thought they were worse off in 2018 was only 13%. But look at it now. Look how badly this has deteriorated over the past few, few observations. We're up to 35%. So say they're worse off now, so a complete flip from a 2018 type of time frame. People felt they were, they were better off. Now they feel that they're worse off in the same type of, of portion. And then we say, are you better off? Well, it's down to 19%. So these are the these are the worst readings in basically nine years uh, that we're showing this data on here. So uh, more uh, angst, certainly, in the way people are perceiving the economy, which leads to, obviously, more subdued uh, animal spirits when it comes to consumer spending. This is uh, interesting. I talked about this two and a half years ago when we were in the lockdown. And I, I predicted we would start to see a deterioration and sort of middle, mid upper level type of uh, middle management jobs. So not super high paying jobs, but clearly not the lowest paying jobs. And indeed that has finally begun to materialize. We see that the number of households receiving unemployment benefits through direct deposit. So it's a subset, but it's an interesting uh, way of looking at it because it's pretty, pretty hard data. We see that the, uh, greater, than, the greater than $125,000 cohort is now actually losing jobs, in essence, faster than even the 50 to 125 cohort or the less than $50,000 cohort. And it's a pretty big percentage. That light gray line uh, is up by about 40, 50 percent uh, over uh, year over year. So this part of the economy is getting hollowed out. And I suspect that that's going to continue, not just, be, uh, not just because of firing decisions, but also because of technological changes perhaps being uh, further accelerated with AI. Here we have um, after tax wages and salaries growth by income groups. So it's the same thing. And this is from Bank of America. 
And we see the same outcome. We actually see that the higher cohort, the greater than 125K, is actually uh, seeing the uh, wage neg negative wage growth. The other cohorts are still uh, positive, but they are declining as well. So we're starting to see higher income people starting to feel the pain of the situation. And uh, this isn't going to help if this wage declines with the credit card spending and with uh, the economic growth. Here's the banks tightening lending standards again, but we're not correlating it to GDP. We're, comp comp we're comparing it to loan growth. So we can see, and there's a, there's a four quarter lead, a one year lead here as well, that we had on the GDP chart. And so one should expect the blue line, which is CNI loan growth to deteriorate because we already see the lending standards survey has clearly shown much tighter lending standards over the past couple of years. And that translates uh, with about a one year lag. And if your eye can tell, can see there's a very high correlation here that we're going to see loan growth contracting. That's already sort of a problem. Uh, and of course, about three months ago, when we did our webcast for total return, we started to have bank failures at uh, SVB and a couple other sort of regional banks. And one of the reasons that we're having problems here is because loan growth is uh, contracting and also the interest rate paid on short-term loans for small business has, thanks to the Fed's actions, clearly exploded higher. In fact, it's more than doubled since the depths of the pandemic. So we're seeing that the interest rate is now the highest that it's been in a decade, and it's pretty high at eight and a half percent. It's pretty hard to uh, pay back and to pay the interest on an eight and a half percent loan when you're in an economy that's growing in nominal terms, you know, less than that amount. So uh, that's sort of the issue that's facing the, our economic prospects, which is another reason why I think recession is a very high probability come the end of this year, or certainly by the first part of next year. Real estate is very much in the news, struggling, and it's pretty interesting. We've got various sectors of the stock indices here. We've got the S&P 500, that's the black one that looks like it's doing pretty well. Of course, everybody sort of knows that there's seven stocks in the S&P 500 that are responsible for basically all the return this year. If you look at the S&P 493, it depends what day you look at it, but broadly speaking, it's unchanged year to date, this S&P 493. It's the, it's the S&P 7, the AEI stocks and, and others that struggled last year that have really uh, carried the S&P 500. We see the Bloomberg Office Property Index down there in orange is collapsed and it's at a new low. We see the bank stock index, the KBW, that's the regionals. Uh, we see obviously that has collapsed. And then we see uh, regional bank stock index uh, on there. And the, all, all those are in a really weak kind of trending uh, situations. So uh, that's, that's going on. And then we have the bank failures. And this is interesting because as percentage of GDP, it's only a couple of banks, but they're pretty large uh, that have failed. And so we see that the only times you get percentage of GDP above 2% in terms of bank failures was the Great Depression and then the SNL crisis uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and then the global financial crisis. And we're pretty close to the level as a percentage of GDP as those past two experiences that led to financial distress and, of course, uh, significant recessions. So this is what this is the what we're dealing with economically, and so it's hard for me to figure out where the accelerant is supposed to come from for those people that want to project higher uh, economic growth. Here's the issue in the regional banks that people are talking about: it's total bank deposits and the assets and money market funds. The bank deposits are down by about a trillion dollars, and we see that the uh, money markets are up by a couple trillion dollars over the past year or so. And this is the problem that these banks are having is that they have to pay so much, their, their, their portfolios aren't throwing off very much money and they can't uh, really pay their depositors what would be attractive. And so people are going to money market funds to avoid the risk, particularly government money market funds, to avoid the risk of potential bank failures that might or might not be guaranteed, although they did guarantee SVB, which is curious for all their deposits. But uh, if this continues, and it's good news that the red line has decelerated uh, going to the downside. But if the Fed keeps raising interest rates, which I do not expect, but if the Fed does raise interest rates further, uh, this uh, trend could reaccelerate, and that could be uh, further problems in the banking system. 
Uh, and of course, this is the thing that nobody wanted to talk about prior to these banks failing is there are massive unrealized losses on investment portfolios at US banks. So we see uh, how the higher interest rates from the pandemic with the Fed raising rates and the bond market anticipating in advance that the Fed needed to raise interest rates, we had a 50% drawdown uh, peak to trough on the 30 year US Treasury bond. And of course, these institutions had to own longer term securities. They can't, you can't hedge out the interest rate risk. There's this urban legend that I keep hearing in financial media that these banks were badly managed because they should have hedged out their interest rate risk. It doesn't work that way. You can't hedge out the interest rate risk without going back to a zero interest rate. There's no free money. If, if you want a yield above zero, you want to buy, you buy the, the long bond at 2%. Well, if you hedge out that uh, int the duration risk, you're going to be right back at a zero yield. So it doesn't work that way. So the problem is that there's still, although it's gotten better with interest rates no longer rising, really since last October, point to point, we still see that the losses are very severe and any kind of a run on deposits that could be caused by the Fed further raising interest rates, which is a good reason why they shouldn't do it. Um, it could lead to further dust ups in the regional banking system. Um, now let's talk about inflation. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting underneath inflation is the money supply. I mean, when you, when you gun the money supply, that's the definition of inflation, really. Uh, and it might show up in financial assets, and which it certainly did for a while. And now then it showed up in food and energy and other commodities. But it's interesting that the money supply is now the most negative that it's been since the Depression, which is not really uh, make one's, uh, you know, calm somebody down, that we're in the same position with M2 growth as we had in the Depression. But uh, it, one good thing about it is monetary contraction does take pressure off of inflation. I mean, here's the proof of that. This is M2 uh, versus CPI. And uh, what we see here is that, that when the M2 uh, goes down, particularly a lot, we see inflation relaxes and then vice versa. So this suggests that the uh, CPI on here, that the CPI should be coming down. It's at 4.9 right now. It's been coming down very fast, almost exactly the speed at which it went up. And now we see this collapse in money supply. So the inflation rate uh, is still elevated, I guess, particularly if you look at it over the last two-year period, uh, using a two-year inflation stack. But the M2 problem of is no, no longer stoking uh, inflation using this correlation. So here's the CPI, and the headline is 4.9, and the core is 5.5. So for the first time in a couple of years, the headline is below the core, but the core is up at 5.5, and that's kind of sticky. And the Fed has repeated uh, relentlessly that they're getting this inflation rate. They're going to get it back down to their target, which they say is 2%. I think if they got to 3 they'd, they'd be pretty satisfied with that. There's a lot of talk that really maybe the inflation target isn't really 2%. I mean, a lot, a lot of people thought the 2% number was just created out of thin air. In fact, some Fed chairman even said that in decades past. But what we see now is the inflation rate is certainly coming down. And I would expect the CPI will fall further, particularly if the recession shows up. I mean, that almost always would lead to, uh, to uh, some decline in the CPI. But we'd have to see exactly what shape that recession takes, because sometimes you can have a stagflationary situation uh, with the money supply doing what it is. I don't really think that's the base case. This is um, contribution to the headline. CPI inflation. And so you see services is a huge slug of, that's the blue part of the stacked bars, is a huge slug of the source of inflation. In fact, the only thing else is really is food. Services and food is just about the whole thing. Energy is now contributing uh, deflation to the economy and oil is really is kind of stuck at around 70 plus or minus for uh, WTI in spite of uh, price cuts being talked about from some of the oil producing, producing nations. But it's really uh, services, which tends to be pretty sticky, and then food, which uh, perhaps will come down, might, might depend on, on the weather this summer. Here's the contribution to core inflation. And here, we just break it into three things. Shelter is a big piece here. Shelter represents more than half of the inflation right now. Core services X shelter, which is Jay Powell's new uh, newfound preferred 
inflation measure. So you're talking about a very small fraction of the economy. I think core services X shelter is less than 25% of the, of the total uh, components of the CPI, but uh, shelter is a, is a big, big piece. And then we see uh, the core goods X shelter, uh, that's still pretty sticky. That's what Jay Powell was looking at. And then we see core goods, which is contributing almost nothing to inflation. So right now it's that super core that Jay Powell has been following for the past eight months or so. And then there's shelter. And shelter has been stickier than most people expected. Most people thought with mortgage rates going up so much that it would be a real disinflationary uh, to housing. But what people in fact factor in is the change in mortgage rates, which I'm going to get to. This is uh, at super core inflation uh, uh, that uh, I like to look at. We've got it on here, uh, less housing and uh, same numbers basically for both of these lines. Here's the PCE. Uh, Fed likes this one too. I think this one's one of the most manipulated, uh, m easy to manipulate uh, inflation series. But here we see the same thing as we saw in the CPI, and that is that the core is now 4.7. It's higher than the headline, which is 4.4. So headline PCE and headline CPE, uh, uh, CPI are just about the same, both in the mid fours. And uh, we might be ending the period of rapid deceleration in the, the PCE and the CPI because we now have uh, we, we now have the easy comparisons. The the, the, the numbers that are rolling off uh, have helped uh, because there were big numbers that rolled off. They've helped. They haven't been replaced with the same magnitude this year as they were in the same months last year. That's about to come to an end, it, it appears. So we, we expect to see inflation come down, but uh, not at the pace that the Fed wants to see. So it'll be a real interesting tug of war between the recessionary indicators and the Fed wanting to get closer to their target. And those th two things are very much at odds. Uh, so it's a quite, quite a tightrope they need to walk. Now, let's look at some inflation numbers that I think are a little bit more representative of what's really happening. First is what used to be called wholesale prices, the producer price index year over year. It's down to 2.3. I mean, my gosh, the final demand piece of it's down all the way down to what the Fed wants at near the 2% number. And it leads the CPI. So there's a reason to believe the CPI will come down. And then we see X food and energy, it's at 3.2. So we had the PPI back there a year ago up in the double digits for the final demand and nearly 10% for the X food and energy. And that's come all the way down really to pre-pandemic types of levels back to 2018 types of levels when the Fed was seemingly completely relaxed about the inflation conditions. So these are sort of reasons why maybe the bond yields have stopped going up. I mean, bond yields uh, peaked late last October into November, and they're down quite a bit, uh, although uh, trading in a range and 10-year Treasury can't seem to get above 4% uh, and, and stay there, can't even get up to 390 these days. And we see that uh, the short rates have, have gone up. We'll see this. We'll see this in a minute. Let's see, my screen has uh, changed. I need some help. Okay, there we go. I hit the wrong button. Okay, so that's producer price index. So here's my favorite inflation measures because they're the most unadulterated. They're just prices and they don't have all these hedonics and, uh, and replacements. It's just export and import prices. Now, the mix can shift. So it, it, it's going to be mix shifts can have some effect on it. But look at what, where, where these levels are. U.S. import prices are now negative 4.8% year over year, and export prices are negative 5.9% year over year. These are some of the lowest readings that we've seen in the, in the past decade and a half. So uh, these prices have certainly uh, come down. In fact, they're in deflationary mode right now. So I'm wondering why people are so bearish on bonds uh, or had been so bearish on bonds, because many of the things that one should worry about with bonds, A, inflation, that's been relaxing, and B, really low interest rates. Well, they might be low uh, for people like me that remember double-digit interest rates, but clearly interest rates are a lot higher now than they were uh, two and a half years ago. And so bonds are much more attractive, and their inflationary nemesis has been in retreat. So uh, that's why I think bonds are superior asset class right now, I've been advocating sort of a, instead of a 60-40 type of portfolio mix, I've been advocating more like 30-60-10. So 30 stocks, uh, 60 bonds, and 10 real assets. 
And that real asset that I've liked is gold, which has gone up this year, uh, but has a very hard time staying above uh, 2000. Now here's wage inflation, different measures. This is getting a little better, but wage inflation has been somewhat sticky. Not so much for the greater than $125,000 earning crowd, which we saw earlier, but we see the, the blue line, average hourly earnings, that's come down a fair amount. That's come down from 7% to about 5%. The Atlanta uh, Fed wage growth tracker, that's the black line, that's been stubborn, still running about 6%. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Cost Index uh, is, is a sort of a quarterly number, so we don't have as many observations, but it looks a lot like the wage growth tracker. It's just a, it's just a percent or, uh, or and a half or so less. So these need to come down, and this is why the Fed needs to weaken the economy, because it's clear that the wage component of things uh, has been slower to come down than commodity prices. Here are commodity prices, Bloomberg Commodity Index, and we talked about this for the past year, how it just can't get above its 200-day moving average. And I like gold just because it's a kind of a real money sort of a thing for part of your financial portfolio. But I really don't like commodities. I haven't liked them for a year just because the economy's weakening and we're probably going headed to a recession sooner rather than later. And commodity prices probably won't go up uh, during a recession. And so I've not liking commodities and it's been a good thing to not like uh, for the past really two years now, or at least a year and three quarters. So we'll be following that. It certainly has not looking inflationary, the commodity complex. Here's gold, long-term. And look at that triple top. So uh, it gets above 2,000 and stays there for a very short period of time. And now we're back down to about 1965 or so, I think, as, as of today. And uh, so you need, you know, it seems like gold's been consolidating. It's certainly done well over the past year, I've gone from 1,600 up to nearly 2,000 now. But I'm, no, I'm, I'm less bullish on gold simply because of this triple top concept, but I still, I still own it. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, scatter of the core CPI on the y-axis and the um, unemployment rate on the x-axis. And we've got the, the dates when the Fed started cutting rates. Those are all those dates on there. Those are years when the Fed stopped raising rates and started cutting them. And here we are today. So we're at very low unemployment. So certainly uh, the unemployment piece of it is what the Fed's probably focusing on. And we have the CPI that's very much in the context of some of these, some of these dots. So it's really the unemployment rate uh, that is, 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 gets, is uh, keeping the Fed on the snugger side. Oops. Speaking of that, here's what the Fed, here's what interest rates have done. And this goes back uh, to, uh, uh, this goes back, there's two lines on here. There's the orange, which is December of 01 of 21, sorry. So uh, that, that goes back a year and a half now, just about. And we've got uh, yesterday. And so the blue line obviously is inverted and we see the orange line was quite steep, uh, 100 uh, from uh, one month out to 30 or 188 basis points, but now we're inverted by about 130. Uh, so this is what the Fed has done. I, I really think, and I talked about this uh, at the time, I really think the Fed screwed up by waiting about a year too long to raise interest rates and not uh, raising them fast enough. I think that's why inflation got as, as high as it did, why it's been uh, somewhat sticky in parts of the inflation picture. I think they should have raised, when, when they raised rates the first time, they pro had probably should have already raised rates by 200 basis points by the time they actually got started. And so they really sort of unleashed this conundrum that they put themselves in. And I, I also think long rates, went up in anticipation of the Fed kind of goading the Fed into raising interest rates. And I think if they had raised interest rates sooner and faster, we wouldn't have had yields go up as much. We might not have had these failures in the banking system. So uh, it's, it's unfortunate. This is the interest rates going back uh, to uh, early 2022. And we got the two-year Treasury yield, which uh, even at the start date was quite a bit above zero. Uh, by then, it was getting way ahead of the Fed. The Fed had to follow the two-year Treasury higher. Then we see it peaked out the two-year in the upper left at 507, and then we had the big collapse because that was the banking crisis uh, with SVB, 
and a couple other banks failing, and that would make people think the Fed might be in, a, in a, a need, need to ease interest rates. But that attitude has relaxed in the past a couple of months. So you'll notice that the two-year Treasury today is exactly where it was back in about September, October, November of last year. So we've had no change in interest rates now for almost a year on the two-year. Look at the panel to the right of it. There's the five-year. Same picture. It's not as, it's not as volatile but we're basically at the same interest rate as we were around October, November of last year. 10-year treasury, same thing. It's coiling and consolidating. The 30-year treasury looks a lot like the 10-year, so the yields haven't really moved very much over that, over that time period. There have been yields in various parts of the market that are, people are concerned about that have moved, and we'll get to that in a minute. Just to take a visit with our friend, the copper-gold ratio, it's really disconnected here. Uh, the red line is the 10-year Treasury yield. It's up at 369 uh, as of yesterday. And we see the blue line, copper-gold ratio, suggests that the 10-year the, uh, Treasury yield might have fair value down at around 2% or so. So there's certainly room for the 10-year Treasury to rally, particularly based on copper-gold and on the idea that inflation is declining. Here's uh, yields in the fixed income sector. Uh, in the fixed income market. These are so-called yields to worst, so it's to the worst call date, but it, does, it assumes no defaults on all these credit positions. And of course, the market is rather strongly suggesting that there's going to be defaults. Look at the uh, yield to worst on triple C uh, leverage loans, 19.4. Uh, well, uh, obviously, triple C leverage loans are in some pretty big trouble because they float every, every 90 days or so and the Fed's raised rates 525 basis points. So these companies that are marginal uh, credits at triple C, that's being kind to say that marginal, uh, everyone obviously expects defaults there. We can also see investment grade uh, uh, or high yield bonds, uh, the triple C, uh, that's 13.2. Obviously the market is getting ready for defaults. I pointed out in my last webcast, that when the lending standard survey, the SLOOS survey, shows significant tightening of credit conditions, you, set, you start to get defaults in high yield within about a year. And they've been tightening uh, for a year. And obviously, that tightening has accelerated with the SVB situation, uh, further uh, leading to caution from lending officers. So we can get to the aggregate on the left, 4.7. So we have a yield advantage, net of fees in the iShare class of about uh, 60 basis points or so. Uh, and then we see that uh, treasuries are at 4.1. That's all, a lot of that coming out of the short end of the curve. And then we see investment grade credit at 5.4. So lots of yield, uh, unlike three years ago when we were living in the fixed income dungeon, where their spreads were super tight and the treasury yields were basically non-existent, particularly on the short end. That's gone now. There's plenty of opportunities in the bond market. So these bond funds, if you think about the risk of them, and the reward of them, uh, back a year and a half ago, stocks were cheap to bonds, as overvalued as stocks were, they were cheap to treasury bonds and bonds broadly. But thanks to this increase in yields, bonds are absolutely cheap to stocks at the present moment and would be a much uh, more relaxing way of, of earning returns than white knuckling it in a stock market in, a, in an economy that's perhaps going into a recession. Here's a credit performance year to date. So we've sliced and diced the fixed income sectors. And you'll notice that CMBS triple Bs really stand out because that's a sec sector that everybody knows, particularly in the office space and major downtown areas, have a lot of vacancies and a lot of problems. But that's not lost on the market. Uh, that's why that's negative 3.8 year to date. So there's certainly opportunities galore in CMBS. We can see the best performing sector is triple C high yield, up 6.8%. So rebounding from the, the carnage of last year. And we see that high yield broadly is up 4.5. That's pretty good. And CLOs are doing quite well. We talked about this in the Just Markets webcast, that some of these securitized products have, were lagging the corporate bond market, and they're certainly catching up. And we think that there's a lot of room for that uh, still to come, even though it's happened partially so far this year. Here's spreads, just to check in on investment grade on the left and uh, high yield on the right. You'll notice the scales are very different, but the charts look identical. They look like the same chart, it's just that the scales are different. So we saw the blowout in spreads during the, the lockdown. 
and then they, they came all the way back down uh, to, to where they were pre-pandemic. And then we see they widened out part of uh, 2022, and now they've kind of stabilized. So these spreads have really lost their volatility over the past couple of quarters, just as the treasury market has settled into more of a range. So we don't have this trending market that we had to suffer through last year. But watch out, there's something out there that this is why these bank loans at the lower tiers are uh, trading at such ridiculous uh, yields if there's no defaults, but there's gonna be defaults. And not only will there be defaults, but this is the law, the recovery rate is calculated 30 day post default prices. So in other words, how, how much are you recovering? So if a bank loan defaults, are you getting back the 70 cents that most models used to predict would be a base case? Well, no, you haven't had a 70 cent uh, type of recovery rate in the past eight years. Uh, well, I, I, I guess you did back there in 2017, but now we're running at 50 cent recovery rate and we're not even in a recession. So if a recession comes, these recovery rates could be pretty scary on some of these, uh, and these are floating rate too, so, which means the pressure is on the CFO of, of a bank loan borrowing company, the, the pressure's on right now. Here's something good about the high yield bond market, um, which uh, uh, Robert Cohen, who, who runs our uh, credit group, brought to my attention, I wanted to bring it forth. Look at the percentage of new issue high yield that's secured versus unsecured. You'll notice that the unsecured stuff back in 07 and 08 was almost everything. And gradualistically over the past five, six years, we've seen the secured percentage of new issuance go up. And that's obviously being secured is a lot better than being unsecured. So the high yield bond market uh, might look a little tight for on a yield spread going into recession. But one thing you have to acknowledge is that it is lower risk, certainly the issuance of this year, and it was getting lower risk because more of it was being secured. So that's a good thing for the high yield market. And look at the share of high yield by seniority. Look at look at where uh, where unsecured uh, was and wh and where secured is now. So secured was six percent of the entire high yield index, and now it's twenty nine percent. Obviously, that's going to continue to grow if the trend of this year and last year uh, moves moves uh, along the way into the future. We'll be getting more and more percentage of the high yield market that is secured, and that's a good thing, obviously, and we would. We're, support the idea that maybe spreads don't have to blow out, uh, even if there's a recession, as much as they did on average historically, because the market mix is changing. And here's uh, where spreads are, uh, and this is plotted against leading economic indicators. So high yield spreads on the y-axis, leading economic indicators year over year change on the x-axis, and then we've done a fit. And you'll see that the current spreads on high yield relative to leading indicators uh, they look very tight. So while the credit quality of high yield bond market is definitely better, the spreads seem a little bit on the snug side based upon this fit. But one more thing on the credit quality, bond recovery rates definitely deteriorate much worse for unsecured bonds during recessions than they do for senior secured bonds, which are making up an increasing pr proportion of the high yield index. You know, it's the light blue line it really kind of never goes below about 40 or 50, whereas the dark blue line, which is the recovery rate on unsecured bonds, uh, is like half that or worse during recessions. So the high yield bond market is vulnerable to recession. Spreads are a little bit tight, but it is true that the credit quality of the high yield bond market is better uh, than it's been really at any time in the existence of the high yield bond market going back, which goes back to the 80s. Here's... Let's just take a real quick look at uh, EM. But here are spreads on EM. But they look very similar to the spreads on high yield and on investment grade. They've, they've tightened less than we've seen tightening in the high yield market, investment grade market over the past couple of years. Uh, and But uh, they've stopped really, they've lost a lot of their volatility as well. It seems like the emerging market category can't really get to 600 basis points sustainably uh, versus treasuries. And in fact, this year, we haven't really been able to sustain even 500 basis points. And we've been around this 463 number for a lot of the past uh, several months, going back to October or so. Um, here's uh, MB spreads, emerging market spreads, plotted against the dollar. It's very obvious 
that they're correlated. So when the dollar goes up, emerging market spreads tend to widen. When the dollar goes down, they tend to tighten. That has not happened now. So maybe there's a little bit of a divergence, a little bit of an alligator jaws situation in the last couple of months. So maybe emerging markets are about to uh, perform a little bit better. And the dollar index uh, will probably start to go down, particularly in the next recession, and particularly if we don't deal with our deficit problems, which we just kicked the can a couple of years down the road. So I think it's fair to say that we're not going to be dealing with our deficit problems in the next, uh, in the next year, but we have to do it after that. And that's going to be a very interesting process. Here's um, the Dixie Index going back to 1998, and uh, you know it rallied from the global financial crisis into late 2022, and then started weakening. And dollar has stopped weakening for the near term. In fact, it's rallied a little bit, up to about 104. But I certainly expect that we're going to see that line ultimately, that horizontal line ultimately, uh, it will will meet that line, and I believe we're going to take it out to the downside. So the dollar is likely to be vulnerable, and that's going to be good for non-dollar investments and ultimately probably lead to a tailwind for emerging market uh, debt. Here's JP Morgan Emerging Market Currency Index, which looks a lot like the commodity chart, although this one now has broken below its 200-day moving average where it had been above it. So it's really uh, not sending much of a signal here. But I, I guess I would suggest that the Emerging Market Currency Index probably has bottomed. Uh, so it's it's going sideways, not a lot of action right now, just like spreads have been going sideways, not a lot of action. But I do expect this index has bottom. That'll be good for EM. Here's mortgages. But look at mortgage rates. Uh, they were down there at two and three quarter percent for a long time. We haven't taken this back to uh, you know f- f- uh, past uh, 2021, but they were down at those levels, three percent or lower for a very long time. And then we had interest rates go up, and they went up to seven, and they're still above seven for the third year uh, uh, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae rate. Uh, and people think, well, wow, I mean, you, you would think that would be really, really bad for the housing market. But one thing that people don't uh, won't focus on enough is how high uh, pe- the, the, the commitment rate is today versus the outstanding mortgage debt. So if you're one of these people that took out a two and three quarter percent mortgage, you might want to move, but the, to get rid of your mortgage and to take out a new one up at seven uh, percent or so, more than double what your rate was, that's not a very attractive proposition. So there's just nothing for sale uh, versus history in in the mortgage industry in the United States, and we can see that. Here's the uh, MBA U.S. mortgage purchase rate which is really low. I mean, it's, it's the level that we were in the, in the shock, the aftershock of the global financial crisis. We're actually lower today than we were at any point in the global financial crisis. We're off the all-time low, which looks like a year-end anomaly to me here, but we're basically on the lows uh, going back uh, through the entire data set, even though this only goes back to 01. It's about the low, lowest it's ever been. So we're seeing the strange thing that housing prices haven't dropped very much. Uh, there's some some uh, metropolitan areas are down a few percent, but uh, some of the more, more recent data actually was showing stability uh, year over year in in prices. So there's not there's no stress really in uh, there's no no dis- default stress at all in the um, mortgage market for agency mortgages. You you would like defaults. You're not going to get any, but you'd like defaults because a lot of these securities are trading at a discount, and if it defaults, you're guaranteed at par. But in the non-agency mortgage market, uh, there's just no default pressure really to speak of, just tiny, tiny deteriorations, if any. And now here's, the, the, thanks to the rise in interest rates and the fact that on the two, two charts ago, I sh- showed how much higher than the coupon is on the mortgage market are new issue rates that prices of existing securities are down. And so this negative convexity problem in mortgages is non-existent. There is no negative convexity to speak of. In fact, it got positive but but the only time in most people's careers uh, last year, but it's still hovering at about zero. So we don't have that convexity problem. So you would think that mortgages should be pretty rich versus their typical pricing, but it's nothing could be further from the the case. We see that mortgage rates went up, uh, spreads went up a lot. They went from 120 uh, in 
January of, of, of this year and from about 110 in August of last year, and they just skyrocketed up to a high of 193 basis points. That's because everyone was so worried about the disposition of this SVB stuff and other failed banks. But as is always the case, the market anticipates and these spreads blew out. And so once, when they finally started to liquidate or accelerate the liquidations of some of these mortgage pools, that was the peak in mortgage spreads. So mortgage spreads are still really attractive. And particularly relative to their lack of negative convexity, this could be one of the most attractive points to own the agency mortgage market. And I think I saw an article on Bloomberg today with uh, some competitor of ours uh, coming to the same conclusion uh, that agency mortgages are the cheapest part on a risk-adjusted basis, certainly, in the entire fixed income market. And here's on an option-adjusted spread basis. So we're taking into account uh, the callability, which doesn't really exist right now, but certainly has been a factor for much of the past 25 years. And so we see that the OAS was negative back there in uh, 2021. Uh, and then when the spreads widened out, we've been reinvesting in mortgages, but we see the OAS is very high. Uh, so the mortgage market is just sy systematically cheap. And now finally, we take a look at interest rate volatility. So you'll notice that mortgage spreads, which is the, uh, the red line plotted against the blue line, which is interest rate implied volatility from the market, they're basically the same line. So one of the reasons that mortgage spreads went up is the implied volatility went up, but also it went up in anticipation of these dispositions from the failed banks. So we see that the mortgage spread definitely tracks with volatility. So what's the, what's the prognostication for volatility? Well, one thing that's interesting is volatility tends to be quite high before the Fed pauses. Just look at the left panel here. I'm not going to speak to the right one. The left panel, these are, these are trading days relative to, to, the, to the last hike using historical uh, interest rate cycles. You'll notice that the volatility goes down pretty remarkably and then stays very stable for a, a number of weeks as the Fed uh, pauses uh, interest rates uh, or stops hiking, uh, does, does its last hike. So that rather strongly suggests that we should expect a decrease in volatility as the Fed is getting close to or maybe already has done their last hike. I think they already have done their last hike. And so volatility should be coming down in the weeks ahead, which means mortgage spreads have a huge tailwind to be tightening in, making them even more attractive relative to the Treasury bond market. So with that, I uh, thank everybody for joining us. Thank you for your uh, interest in Double Line. Thank you for your confidence in Double Line. So, so with that, I wish everybody a, a, a nice summertime. And uh, we'll be back in September from back to school situation. And thank you for your support and goodbye for now.